Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you may be. Thanks for making us part of your Wednesday. We are super excited to have our first GMS live show of 2023 and no way, no better way to do it than by inviting the reigning national championship coaches. You see him on the screen there, Jared Elliott, head coach from the University of Texas and associate head coach of the Longhorns, Eric Sullivan in the bottom right uh, let's get right to it, Jarrett. Let me be the 10,000th person probably to tell you congratulations on an awesome 2022 season. As a volleyball fan, it was super fun watching what you guys were able to accomplish. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's not going to get old hearing it over and over again. But uh, <laughs> yeah. great experience. Uh, we did it the right way and uh, super fired up. And, uh, of course, Jerry and Eric, thank you so much for uh, for being gracious with your time and joining us. We're excited to... Uh, to hear from you and to learn from you and to improve as coaches uh, from what we see and hear over the next hour. Um, Eric, you as an assistant coach, um, I just want to get your thoughts on this as I was watching the ESPN broadcast throughout the final four, and then we'll dive into some X's and O's after you address this, but uh, the, the announcers on ESPN made it a point to let us know that your girls were playing for coach Elliot and they wanted to win uh, for coach Jarrett. Can you tell me just from your perspective, what is that connection that he has like with your players and how can coaches, youth coaches, high school coaches, club coach coaches make those types of connections with our athletes? Yeah. 
Uh, I think one, Jared's done a really great job of creating a culture here that's pretty horizontal. It's not a top-down organization. We try to empower our girls to have a voice in what we do. Um, so I think they feel like they're a part of our program and our program success, not just getting led along the way. And secondly, he spends a lot of time. We spend a lot of time. All of our staff associated with our program spends a lot of time um, just investing in relationships with our kids. And um, I don't know, the, the more that I'm in this, the more that I feel more, um, I don't know, it's a bigger part of me feeling great about what we do is the stuff that's happening outside the gym. Um, I, I think you get a perspective as you're in this for long periods of time that you're always going to have another season until you either get fired or retire. And even if you do win it, you know, a week later, I'm in the office thinking about what are we doing to try to win it again? And so the highs aren't probably as high as you build them up to be and the lows aren't as low as you make them out to be. And at the end of the day, it's about the relationships with the girls. And so I, I just think one, it was a really cool group. I think all the girls were, we just had the right mix of personalities. And um, I think the culture was right. And I just think they, in, as well as we, just invested in each other. And I think that was a big part of it. I think they all felt really connected to one another as well as to us, which I, I don't know, Mike will tell you, that's, I think, rare, especially as you've been on it both sides. It's, it's hard to really get that integration. I mean, you can do it within the team and within the staff, but to get the staff and the team all on board is pretty cool. Eric, I, I got to admit, I spend most of my time watching you and your celebrations from the bench <laughs> than I do your actual, the actual volleyball. So as long as we can keep those going, I'll be a fan. Yeah. In my advanced age, I've got to save that stuff for the postseason. I got about three weeks of it in me. Can't do it throughout the season anymore. Okay, good. I like it. Keep it going. <laughs> Eric, I was for that. I'm sorry. You get any of the highlight clips, Mike, of him uh, keeping no. on as director of ops? I mean, when I'm watching these games, my, my eyes go right to Eric on the sidelines, running out on the court. So, so David Hunt, I think this right after printed this, which is a on the front is a picture of our girls celebrating, but he actually did it for that piece. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think just to kind of rub it in my face a little bit. I love it. I love it. That's how it should be. <laughs> Hey, I was scrolling through the the official Longhorns Instagram account a couple days ago, and Eric, there's a pretty awesome video of you cheering that they got. Oh, uh, the fist pumps, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, to be to be honest with you, like I, it was kind of the same feeling for me too. Like I'm so stoked. Obviously, I'm happy for myself. It's a cool thing to be a part of. But one, super stoked for Jarrett because he's been here building this thing for 20 some years, and I just think it helps validate all of the cool things that he's done, but also for just our group this year, it was just a, I don't know. I, I went and spoke to some, some of our boosters and I was like, I'm, I'm sure there's no coach in the world. That's won a national title that walks in and doesn't say that this was a special group. Right. It, but it just really was like, there just wasn't a bad, I can't remember like a day of practice where you just walked out going, Whoa, what's going on? everybody was always just in a good mood. They always wanted to work hard. They were always trying to work for each other. Um, it was just, it was a cool, it was a cool year. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, couple, uh, couple housekeeping items here real quick. Everyone out there will be back here a week from today with Dan Fisher and some Pittsburgh coaches. We'll be breaking down some of their season. So please uh, put that on your calendar. The week after that, we'll be joined by some Louisville coaches also coming off a second straight, final four appearance and uh and so we're excited for all these upcoming shows that uh, we hope that you'll all join us for and uh if you would like to join us for a coaching clinic please vis visit goldmedalsquared.com and you can see all our locations there we'd love to have you and finally if you're watching right now and would like one of these stanley cup water tumblers go ahead and throw hashtag gms plus into the comment section on youtube or facebook wherever you're watching and uh, we'll do a drawing at the end of the show and we'll get one of those sent out to you um we're calling this show what we love about texas and as a volleyball coach myself as a volleyball fan and as um and as a member of this gold medal squared staff it's hard not to love your offense 
uh, Coach Elliot, and um, you're always at the top of this list, either at the very top, like you were in 2022, or near the top of this hitting percentages list. Can you just give us uh, what about your offensive philosophy helps you rise to the top of this hitting percentage list year in and year out? Well, I think, uh, first of all, we obviously are able to recruit the right type of athletes, right? I mean, we have dynamic, very physical athletes that we're able to kind of develop and, and get into our system of what we're able to do. Um, you know, the numbers this year were really glorified this year because I think in the last few years, we've been, some of our academic admissions have changed. So our, our, I think our backcourt has been significantly upgraded. Obviously, Zoe Fleck coming in and controlling the ball on first contact was huge for that. But, you know, I thought, you know, Eric is my defensive coordinator on the, in this program and David runs the offense. And I think, you know, when you have a, the kind of balance that we have and you have the experience that we have from, the international level with both Eric and David bring and, and we're able to sit around and discuss things. I think you look at, you know, how do you pick apart certain kind of teams and how do you take advantage of it? And so we have obviously some great matchups that we can get to, especially with this year's team. Um, and we are able to utilize that at a high level. We're going to watch uh, just some free ball offense right now and kind of look at your tempo. Can you, uh, Jarrett, just talk about your, your philosophy surrounding speed? and tempo and kind of what you like to do with tempo. And we're going to pause it here when your setters catching the ball, but you have an outside hitter second and a half step. You have an opposite almost on her third step and a quick attack in the middle. And I've been really impressed the past couple of years with your tempo, your offensive tempo. What do you like to do there? And kind of, how are you, how are you pushing tempo? Yeah, I think it's been a conversation amongst our staff for quite some time in terms of how do we manage this and, you know, it's the tempo and it's the location, the two things that we're really kind of looking at here. But, you know, we obviously like them to be on a hard second or second step or third step um, and getting into that that motion and being consistent. You know, we, we're not the fastest team in the country. Um, I think we've got some opportunity to at this level of the game. It doesn't need to be the fastest in the country, at least from my perspective, based on the physicality of athletes that we have. We've got, you know, we've got a, an advantage from a physical standpoint and we don't want to take swings away from them. So we try to manage their their opportunities by just creating a little bit of tempo with a little bit of shape, but not so flat through the zone where they can't be physical and allow them to see some space and, and create some opportunities for themselves. So we like the tempo that we have. We like to give them some opportunities to see space and we like to make sure that we're maximizing the number of quality swings that we're getting. So that's a big component of it. And I think I'm sure at some point um, you'll get into kind of our setting location of where we go. But, you know, we definitely like them on their left foot going hard. Um, there were some situations where we had them a little bit on, you know, two and a half steps in. So they could be you know, almost on that right step based on the scenario and who we were playing and, and what we were trying to do. But, yeah, we try to be real consistent. We try to be consistent with our locations and we like trying to create some space around the block. So our our attackers have some opportunities visually and and tactically to be able to score. So Dave, can I jump in on that real quick? Yep. Um, you know, one of the most common questions we get is related to speed. And, you know, we've all heard that saying, don't do tactically what you can't do technically. And people want to go fast. But I think it's important for listeners to understand there's an inflection point where effectiveness becomes ineffective, even at the highest of levels. And uh, I remember we had this issue with Taylor Sander, who's a flyer, you know, and uh, Texas, you guys have these flyers that can go in and take rips. And there comes a point where if we're pushing this too fast, the number of misconnects and tips and all this stuff outweighs the benefits of running a fast offense. And so if you're listening, that's the point we want to drive home here. There's a there's a point fast is good. We love speed. But if you have big physical athletes in your gym, you're going to have to find that sweet spot where you're not uh, where it's not the inflection point hasn't been reached. Yeah. And I think if you look at our last national champ championship in 2012, I mean, we set the ball to the moon. I mean, we are more, <laughs> we are more Arta Magnova or whatever her name was from Russia that we were setting high balls to the moon and, and we were able to score. And, you know, I think you look at kill percentages and air percentage and hitting efficiency and the type of setter and attackers you have, you have to, you have to look at all those systems. And I think the more that you can study it in your gym and the more that you understand the type of players and how they manage that, um, I, I don't get fascinated with just speed and that speed alone. Uh, it's more about quality and the number of great contacts we can have over a period of time. Yep. And Dave, I don't know that we have the location. Can we talk to that real quick? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
you know, you guys, you guys have found a sweet spot. It seems like two to three, even sometimes four to feet, four feet inside the pin. And what stood out to me is how well you guys still hit line in those situations. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's apparent that you work on it. Uh, and so you can speak to not only pace, but right there, you know, that sets four feet inside and we're still able to hit with some range. So Jared, do you want to, or Eric, do you guys want to speak to that a little bit? We're getting into secret sauce stuff here. These are trade secrets. Okay. <laughs> if there's any trade secrets, you guys can just tell us to move on. <laughs> well, they came out. They came out with it after the final four, and, and kind of really broke some stuff down for us. And I, I think it's, you know, I think if you study enough, I think a lot of the top coaches understand this. But you know, I think the, the wider you get, the lower your hitting percentage, your efficiency goes down, your kill percentage goes down, and your error number, error percentage goes way up on that. So. You know, the more that I've been coaching, the more I like it inside. I just think there's opportunities to be able to, one, it gets really hard for, for pin blockers to be able to pick good spots. Um, and two is if you look at terms of how people move in the static jump, they're not able to be as quite as physical with that as well. Um, and the challenge becomes, can you pick a good spot? And if you're not picking a good spot, you know, you're either giving up big seams or you're giving up big opportunities for the line. And it's really challenging for teams to set up defensively for it. Um, I, th I think it's harder to get four hands in front of you that consistently picking it. And so, you know, we've been really enamored with it and I like the results of it, but it, it creates a lot of space and a lot of opportunities for us to be able to score, uh, especially in the transition game. And I think our, our numbers have gone up significantly as we've really put some, some emphasis into it and, tried to be really good at kind of our location and we're okay airing inside. Uh, we're not okay with airing outside. Awesome. Hey, Eric, you were on a show with us last year, 12 months ago. Exactly. And you mentioned that you don't want to sacrifice quality swings for speed and Jerry and Mike already addressed this, but can you just uh, address that once again, where you're kind of balancing the speed and high quality and how are you, how are you finding that balance? What kind of trial and error are you doing with specific athletes or maybe as a team system in general to find that perfect balance? Yeah, I think all of it is um, just a product of, like you said, of trial and error. And it's a little different for each group. You know, I don't think we come in every year saying, hey, this is going to be the exact tempo. We have some idea of kind of what that baseline looks like, but I think it varies from group to group. I think the setter is a big part of it. I think your ball control is a big part of it. And then obviously your attackers are that final piece. And it's kind of figuring out, you know, where everybody is. And I don't know, you can go through and tease all this stuff out. Like you can tell the balls to Molly on the right side are significantly much quicker than anything else we ran. And yep. that was, I don't know, probably took us a year or two to find that sweet spot for her and realize, you know, just kind of athlete that she's it. she is. She's really long. Um, she uses her height really well. She kind of hits at the apex all the time. She doesn't need a lot of time to get off the ground. You know, she's not a high jumper and she's got crazy range. So the ability to flick it back to her really fast and have space for her to attack made her, I think the attacker that she was, I think she was hitting 370 on the year. Um, so, you know, I, I just think, you know, this year we have a new setter. I think, Sage uh, last year probably didn't get enough credit for what she was able to do with our offense. Everybody looks at our attackers and go, oh, they should be hitting 335. You look at all these crazy attackers. But, you know, look at the top five teams in the country. We're not all – we're not built that dissimilarly from all those teams. And I think Sage came in and did a really good job. She was really consistent. She was able to locate, um, I think, really well. Um, but, yeah, we kind of – I don't know. We don't don't just think we walked in day one and said, hey, here's our tempo and here's what it looked like on December 19th. Um, you know, we would it was probably a little faster when we started and we slowed it down a little bit and then probably got it sped it up a little bit more. And I think we got to some point in October, or November where we felt pretty good about it. I'll add a, I'll add about Molly. I, you know, she's probably got the greatest vision we've ever had. Uh, she finds space mm -hmm. she's able to do that. But one of the things that she does so well, she's get get great hand on the ball. I mean, she's consistently hitting the ball the right way, but she controls the depth of her attacks at a really elite level, which you don't see at the collegiate game a lot. You know, people just swing the swing and, you know, she, you watch a lot of her swings down the line. She'll, she'll get a little of a hand on it and that thing will die along the 12 foot line. And that's done on purpose. So she's worked a lot to, because she doesn't have the dynamic, 
dynamic arm that maybe Logan or Madison had. We had to create some different opportunities for her to be able to create some depth and for her to find different ways to score. Mm -hmm. But that was happened because she just got the tempo, what we created, she could find that space and then she could find the control of the depth of what she wanted to hit. Jared, how would you recommend for club coaches, high school coaches, youth coaches to, to balance speed and effectiveness? Because we're doing it with athletes that we might not have enough or as much time with as you do. And when you're out on the recruiting trail, kind of what are you seeing there? What are some of your takeaways about how youth teams are playing? Well, I think the first component of it is, is the first contact. You know, I, I see a lot of times that young players, there's the passes and the digs are too low. And so when the ball is tailing off, it makes it a lot more difficult for setters to be get good underneath the ball and set tempo. And so, as we know, the setters are not very developed at that age. And so the setting tempos get really, really ugly. So the first and foremost thing that I'm always seeing or that when we do get in some clinics is what type of tempo we have. Can we pass it 15 to 20 feet high up and down into the cylinder and, and then allow the setters to get their feet to the ball so they can be consistent at what they do. Uh, and then you got to evaluate your setter. You know, I, I don't know the quality of all these setters are where they are, but they've got to become pretty proficient. And the more that I've coached, you know, it becomes more of an out of system game than it does an in system game. So the temples are great in system, but I would imagine at the at the junior level, you know, what percentage of times are you in system and does that matter? Or are you where are you putting your time to to be able to find ways to score? And I think that's the fun part about coaching. We're gonna have a, a majority of our team back, but we have a different setter. We gotta figure out ways that we can make her productive so a lot of this will be based on what her skill opportunity is and where she can be consistent but you know the tempos we usually like it to be about antenna height is kind of our range or kind of our goal it's not flat you know foot above the net so but when we're getting out of system you know we want it inside high up and down and the balls in to come into cylinders and can our feet can we get our attackers to the ball it's really simplistic stuff um but the more i've also coached and, and eric did a great job bringing this back from one of the olympics um of just we spend way more time setting out a system. Every player, every single day, it's all about non-setter setting. So a lot of our drills now are are non-setter setting. That's a great tease because we're going to watch some out of system offense uh, from your NCAA tournament in a couple minutes. Hey, Eric, uh, would you address this question? Um, when we're running fast tempo go sets, do you like a four-step approach? Or if the player is doing a three-step approach, when should they start? The approach yeah um the answer is i i don't really care to be honest with you i don't have a necessary preference um i think a lot of times especially as the rallies continue and transition you don't have time to get a four step sometimes it's a two-step approach i think it's where you are on that left foot relative to when that ball is being set um you know again depending on how fast you're running it and what you're doing um, so it's about getting some depth from the net. It doesn't always have to be wide and out. And one of the things I'll tell you is a lot of the young kids that we get in our gym take approaches that if I were taking them and I was an outside, I was an outside for a while in my career. If I get back and start my approach where they want to start from, it makes me anxious. Like they feel like they've got to have this 25 foot runway to go get some some momentum to go hit the ball and it's like whoa what are you doing so you know to, to be honest typically you know for some kind of modified or four-step approach is probably the most normal but that first step is just kind of a little jab step getting that third step going and then how you're using that that second step to kind of modulate speed you know whether you're rolling through it fast because things are going in the system or if it gets held up and you got to put the brakes on a little bit i i think that it's a really interesting concept. Right now we're going through reviews, a kind of a full spectrum of, of them as an athlete on individual meetings, but one of our sports science people is in there and, and you know, we, you can look at some things that we try to do. It's just kind of some of the management of where their force is, where their speed is, where they are as athletes. And we have an athlete right now that um, is able to jump at an extremely high level with some, some distance, but on a shorter string, she's not able to create that same kind of vertical so I've actually was talking to Eric about it yesterday and David. I was like, are we better off throwing her with a four-step just based on the way she's built mechanically and what the stats are showing that, you know, a greater runway is going to give her a little bit more speed, a little bit more physicality. So, again, I think, as Eric says, you, you can't get into a box if this is the only way that we do it. I think you got to look at each athlete 
are there some different ways that you can find that one or 2% that makes that athlete unique? I think about Anderson versus DeFalco, right? <laughs> Anderson needs a mile and DeFalco can just stand there and bounce. You, you go backwards a step. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Speaking of time. Speaking of time, and uh, if you have enough time or not to do what you want to do, um, as I was watching your NCAA tournament matches, I was super impressed by your transition offense. And uh, I hopped onto Volley Metrics and pulled these stats from the top 10 teams to see that your transition hitting percentage 299, which uh, is better than a lot of teams in the country, uh, even first ball um, hitting percentage. And so uh, we're going to break down kind of what helped make your transition offense so good. Courtney Thompson was on a show with us last week, and she said, if you want a good transition offense, you should be a good serving team. And so I pulled up some serving stats. And I also want to thank the University of Texas Athletic Department for sharing these photos with us that you see here from uh, the 2022 season. Uh, so Kevin out there, thank you for sharing these photos with us. Um, but Courtney said, if you want to be a good transition offensive team, serve good. So you get free balls, you get balls that you can dig. And so here are some of your serving stats uh, ranked amongst the other top 10 teams. Highest ace percentage, uh, the best opponent good pass percentage, meaning they pass the worst against you. Highest point scoring percentage. Um, Jerry, I'm, I'm curious because I like to ask this question of coaches a lot. What are some of the cues, language, words you use when you're training setters? Servers. Or servers, excuse me, servers. When you're training servers, kind of what are you telling them? What are they hearing uh, from you when you're when you're coaching them up? You know, there's been lots of debate over the years in terms of is speed more important than a clean contact? And the more that we've been doing this, the more that we feel like a clean serve, a clean contact is really the key component to it. And then one of the stats that you don't have on here, nobody has, is what is the, and I think this is one of the, the biggest errors, is what is the percentage that you're actually hitting the people that you're calling to serve at? Okay. You know, I, I think that's a, a big component to being a great serving team. So can you hit the spot that you're doing? We're taking stats on that. We're keeping stats in terms of how, you know, what our player ratio is to, to be able to hit those players that you want to hit. And so I thought we did a really good job of that in the semis and especially in the finals. Uh, we did it great in the regionals. But, you know, there's obviously there's weak links to every team in each in each component to that. So, you know, obviously the, the big things that I want to be able to see is I want to be able to see the speed and velocity into the approach, um, making sure that our players hit it on their way up. And then can they hit that ball clean to a location where they are? And each one, I'm again, this is another component. I've had some players that just didn't have the ability to create enough velocity. And everybody's, you know, stuck on this one or these two feet. 95% of our athletes are off two feet. But if you go back to 2012, we had Shadair McNeil who couldn't create enough velocity off of two feet. We taught her how to do it off of one. You know, taking that from the Japanese a little bit. So just, again, looking at some different components of how you can make that player unique and and good um, that may not have the components that are natural to most players. What is the speed that you like? Do you have a radar gun out there in practices? And are you looking at that stuff at all? Nope. Uh, uh, so we have in the past. We've messed with it, but it's not... You know, we, we put up a lot of, you know, uh, elastics up when we're serving. We have a lot of targets that we're trying to hit. Um, you know, we're serving from different depths uh, on the court, um, just trying to give some, some spatial awareness. And then just spending a lot of time just trying, can we hit these zones over and over again with a period? And then finding out, you know, I, I'm, I was calling serving this year that there's certain zones I don't want to call with certain players. You know, they're just not comfortable hitting it. And, you know, Eric's in my ear all the time, just hit your, your best serve, Jared, all the time. Um, and he's, he's right a lot of the time in that, in that component of it all. But, you know, there's times also where you want to hit the best zone if you have that ability to, to train that over a period of time. So in practice, we're, we're looking at zones. We're looking at, I'm giving them zones every time we're, we're doing it to evaluate, can they hit this ball a lot and can be, they be consistent with it? And Kayla, you know, was phenomenal. If you saw her last year, she was primarily a zone one server. Um, this year we gave her another weapon to be able to serve down the line and, she scored late in the, in the regional final when it was really tight at 21-20. And I think she obviously won the national championship with that serving run at the end. Hey, Jarrett, when you guys have <clears> – <throat> when you have a run going or re, when you score a point, you're successful on a, either a specific athlete or in a specific zone, 
do you like to stick with it or do you like to mix it up? Um, I like to usually stick with it. Uh, you know, I have some, some theories in terms of if you're serving zone five, where that pass goes a lot. Um, if you're serving zone one, where that ball, that ball goes percentage wise, and then really kind of looking at the matchups and talking to Eric and saying, Hey, we good serving this zone. This is what's going to happen to the server. And he's like, yeah, no. Or I think this person's going to get the ball. And do we change that? So 98% of the time, we're going to stay with the same zone. I think there's some mental stuff and pressure putting on them um, to be able to do that. But on occasion, we'll mix it up. Cool. I paused the video. I paused the video um, 45 seconds ago or so because uh, I noticed as I was watching your servers that most of them serve from either zone five or zone one. Uh, you have Zoe Fleck sometimes was serving from left back, sometimes from right back. How do you kind of go about deciding if you want your server serving from the same spot or maybe switch it up like she was? Well, typically the, the libero is the best passer. You know, if you, I'll probably look at a, a chart and see, and see that. So by serving line to line, you can eliminate that, that, that player from picking off a lot of your serves. And so depending on what that rotation is, like we can go, you know, five to five or one to one, but we can also go, you know, one to five and five to one. And so we, based on what that is and, and statistically looking at some of those factors, I like some of our players being able to do that. Not everybody has the capability of going from sideline to sideline, but, you know, in the scenarios that we had, we had, you know, based on what we were doing in the finals, we were lucky enough to have the great serve up matchups that we wanted to be able to get the matchups we wanted from, from a serving contact point. Eric, do you have a favorite serving stat? There's a lot of them out there, and a lot of, everyone has a different answer, it seems. Yeah, opponent hitting efficiency. <laughs> I think, it, like Mike says, if you want to be a great defensive transition team, you need to be a great serving team because that's the first step of it. And since I'm, I'm in charge of defense, I don't know, that's the first moment that you get to kind of initiate your defense, at least in my mind. And just to go back to kind of talking about what Jared talks about, like we, we look at the serving piece probably in 45 different ways. You know, is does, does somebody have a very dominant serve? And if even if they're serving at their best passer, is that better than having her serve something that she's not as comfortable at? Is it better to serve from zone one or zone five? Offensively, do they have some challenges, right? Like can they not go long string to their right side or are they not a very efficient there? And if we serve line to line to area five, we know that that ball is going to get pushed into zone four a lot. And you force them into kind of some, you start to make their offense pretty simple. Um, I don't know. There's, there's just, a, I, I think there's a whole bunch of different ways to look at it. We kind of poke at it in all those ways and try to find the best situation for each of the rotations as we're working our way through a match. All right. Before we move on to watching some defense, uh, Jarrett, how much do you work on short serves? Do you like it? Dislike it? Um, and the, the question says, I notice at higher levels, we don't see short serves as often as maybe with lower levels. And uh, is there a reason why? Yeah, I, I, we li I like short serving. Uh, we didn't throw it in a lot this year. Uh, I just felt like we had a really good server. So obviously consistent pressure on players that we can hit. I thought was, was more beneficial. We've really been kind of we've been working on a little bit we didn't throw it in there too much but the the kind of the hybrid between a short and a tough serve where it kind of dies into like a zone seven type situation um just a little bit different of a serve but i do like it uh i didn't have a lot of servers that i felt were really comfortable this year hitting it and i felt like it just depends on the scenario and some of the stats that we are able to see <laughs> Eric, we had two questions come in almost word for word similar. So I'll throw up Justin's. Do you like to mix topspin and float or do you typically prefer the float and what dictates this decision? Yeah, um, a whole bunch of stuff, actually. If I don't think if you've got enough velocity on a topspin ball that it's it's probably an easier ball to pass, especially with the level of float servers in the women's game. You know, I think that's a little bit different. And I don't know, Mike can probably speak to this. I think the float serves definitely got um, some more space to be utilized in the men's game than it is. Um, I just think if you hit a good float serve and it's moving around, it's much easier. It's much more difficult to pass than a medium to good topspin. I think a topspin has got to be with a lot of velocity, a lot of movement. Um, and then you got to look at some error percentage. We've had some kids 
uh, in some recent history that hit a pretty hard topspin ball, but were so high error that it just didn't make a ton of sense. And so, I don't know, we, we get blasted for having them float serve, but they were more effective float serving than they were, you know, cracking a ball every fifth contact. Um, but I, I also think at our level, you just don't see too many women have an arm that the top spins really very effective. All right. Thank you for the questions. If you have more questions, send them in and we'll be sure to pass them along. So, uh, Eric, you're the defensive coordinator. So this slides for you. Um, your dig to kill percentage was the highest among all the top 10 teams. And so, um, we can see your contact to dig percentage, dig to hitting attempt percentage there. Uh, so we'll watch some defense here and kind of let you break it down. But, um, Mike, as, as we, as we like to watch high level defenses, kind of what things uh, do you like to see and what questions do you have for, uh, for Jarrett and Eric about defense? This is one yeah. thing that we feel passionately about. I have a lot of questions about individual defense and how to train it. I think there's in my, in my mind, I think it's a hard thing to, to train, um, especially for younger kids that are learning the game. Um, you know, my guess is, you know, with this team, you've got some high level kids coming in the gym that you're probably just fine tuning um, to some degree in terms of their digging ability. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's some of these big physical hitters that play through the back row that, you know, they need to learn some of the, the sprawl moves and, and dive moves and whatnot. Um, but my, my thing is always how much time do you spend, teaching the movements versus how much time do you spend playing volleyball and teaching the vision. And, uh, and I think blocked activities are good for teaching the movements, but for some people, it's really hard for maybe all people. It's really hard to replicate the exact ball. For example, if you're going to sprawl and go to your belly and play through the ball, that's a hard ball for a coach to replicate in a blocked activity. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I, I find myself struggling to, figure out the balance. And, um, and so I'd love to have that conversation, like for the kids that come into your gym that may not be great going to their bellies or diving or sprawling. Um, how are you guys getting them better? Yeah, we, we do some blocked activities, but not a ton of it. And to be honest with you, I don't know that I've got a template that I use of, Hey, here's what it has to look like. I think everybody's going to be a little different. Um, they're going to function a little different, you know, with someone like Zoe, who we had just for her last year, um, she was obviously pretty good at what she does. And so we didn't really get in there and mess around too much with it. You know, we worked on some arm stuff and tried to clean some stuff up with her. Um, the cool thing with Zoe is she was very inquisitive and very curious about stuff and was willing to try things. Um, didn't mean she always changed everything, but she was obviously a pretty good defender. Um, so I don't know if we, you know, we'll get in and work on it. We have some principles and fundamentals, you know, we want the movements to begin with a step. And so kids aren't just kind of flailing to the ground. Um, most of the time we're looking to play over a lead leg or a knee. Um, you know, you don't want to be going the opposite way. And, you know, just the very simple principle of getting your arms out early and creating an angle and letting the ball kind of work off your platform. Um, I think all hold true, but everybody's going to be a little bit different. And so for me, when we get kids in the gym, if they've got some deficiencies, I try to work within what, how they play the game and clean some of that stuff up. Um, I, again, I don't think there's ever this, hey, it has to look like this for it to be good. Um, we'll just think it's got to kind of all be within those principles to some degree, because we know if you're doing those things that, you know, over time, it's going to be more helpful. Yeah, I feel like, I guess, part of my questioning comes from the fact that I feel like the men's game, and Eric, we've talked about this, is just so far behind. And I think we've used it as an excuse for so long, or the power of the game as an excuse for so long, that France has kind of showed us, okay, yeah, this is possible, and I think we're trending in the right direction. But um, I think that the men need to, you know, I know you guys have taken some stuff from the men. I think the men need to take some stuff from the ladies, and uh, especially in terms of their defensive uh individual defensive movements and, yeah, and make. It, it's interesting. And I don't see enough of the junior stuff with the guys, but I just, I, I feel like there's almost an absence of block training. And to me, I think you need a little bit more of it at young ages where you're trying to develop those habits and fundamentals. 
And I just, I feel like, you know, they'll tell you like, Hey, be here and dig this ball, but they're not really telling you how, and if someone's deficient, they don't try to clean it up. And then that carries with them when they get to the national team. And then there's less of it there for sure. Yeah. But yeah, it's, I'm, I'm a little bit blown away. I don't know what guys look like as they're playing the ball sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> And some, some, I mean, they're getting the ball up, but it's just kind of like, ugh. Yeah. It's not the prettiest of things. Um, another, I think. Even aside for me, I just think there's there's two kind of key things that you're always kind of looking for. Can, can people, can players keep their hips square, you know, and can they bend at a high level where they, they maintain that hip flexion or that hip angle the same way? And when you start getting a lot of twisting of the hips and, unable to bend and get underneath the ball to manipulate the ball. That's where things get, at least for me, get a little bit funky. Um, you know, and I agree with you. Like one of my pet peeves still is players identifying approach speeds and identifying when it's a roll shot and a tip and, you know, short, short step close work to be able to read that. But those are the things that we're trying to work on a lot. Can they, can they get efficient with their hips? Can they get underneath the ball? Can they drive the right knee or the left knee? You know, very basic conceptual moves. Um, and then we'll take, you know, Eric will take them on the side and work some one-on-one -on -one stuff with them. But, you know, I think bending is a big component of it. If you watch the best players, they bend pretty well. Jared, yeah, we get this. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. We get this question a lot at clinics, at camps, uh, when we're doing shows like this. Some coaches want to know where their players should stand. Exactly. Other coaches want to know how they can teach their players how to read what's happening and then stand based on where they're reading. How are you training that in your gym? And uh, and and how would you answer that question? Look, we, we try to be in somewhat of a formation that we try to be consistent with, but it's always changing based on the team that we're playing, based on what they have. Are we against an, an active setter? Are we, you know, are they heavy out of the backcourt? Do we need a little bit more depth in terms of where we start? Um, you know, I, th I think less moves, movement is better. And I think the sooner that they can get to their spot from base to release to, to be set up to look at the play, that helps them a lot of, in terms of identifying what's coming at them to make the right read. Um, and then you can't replicate live play to be able to pick up those things and see the right things, right? It's just, it's the biggest challenge um, that exists. I, I'm surprised that whatever those things are, the VCs things haven't come up with some components where you can kind of train that a little bit more and, you know, see short approaches and roll shots versus approach speeds and step close work and being able to identify that a little bit more. Right. It's just the, the, the process of the sequential pattern of the elimination, the high players see the right things and they eliminate that pretty fast to give themselves a small window to be able to move and run. I, I think we get stuck a lot about being stagnant and stopped but I think there's a lot of opportunities to be thinking about this is an opportunity we should be thinking about running, you know, uh, and, and running through balls. If there's no approach speed and they're jumping from the 10 foot line, that's, you, the ball's not going to come right in your lap. You've got to be thinking in, in the sequential pattern to get your mind right to, to cover 10 feet and to make some plays. So Jerry, I want to add to that. Um, I think it's, so if we go back to the digging clips, there's a whole bunch of balls that, you had either one blocker up or two blockers up and the ball went right in the shadow of the block, right? Like that one, or there's others, or the hitter goes up and they find space and they hit a clean swing. You know, both of them obviously happen, um, which creates a little bit of a, uh, I don't know if it's a challenge, but a reality for our defenders and our defensive systems. And that's that, are we going to let our defenders wander around the court based on what the block's doing? Or are we going to have a base position and trust the balls go there? And then when we need to, if there's a really strong tendency, we're going to start somewhere else. How are you guys handling that? Um, I could, you know, I think we could, we would all agree that if your athletes are wandering around the court, nonstop chasing holes um, that they're going to get beat. Uh, but we also want them to have the freedom to see. Uh, so there's got to be a balance here. So how do we figure that out? I think this is where Eric does a really good job with our defense. I think they're just, you know, he is, he's in the belief of we're stagnant and we're doing the same thing over and over again because you get in trouble chasing the last play a lot, right? I think that what becomes the, the challenge for us. You know, Zoe was a different dynamic for us this year just because she was able to cover and see a lot of areas. So there was some built, I think, for that kind of scenario, there was some trust built between Zoe and Eric and some of our players to be able to give them a little bit more 
free range. In the past, we haven't had players like that. And I'll let Eric speak about it. But I think it's, to, again, not everything's black and white. It's, it's based on your personnel and what your trust is and, and doing it. You're always going to give up something. And it's just what you're, what you're willing to risk in, in terms of doing that. But Eric's a big believer in not chasing the last play a lot. <laughs> um, I mean, we look – the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> we look at all that. We have uh, base positions that will adjust depending on who we're playing. Like Jared talked about uh, before, you know, if we're playing against an active setter or left back, our wing diggers are probably pinched in a little bit, um, depending on where she's active on the court. Um, and then we would like, you know, wherever the ball gets set, we'd like that position to adjust and they're not moving a ton. And then from there, we'd like them to have some range to try to read the play a little bit. I, th I, you know, I think there's some interesting things of reading the play and some of it's understanding volleyball, right? Like you get middle back and all of a sudden they're playing at 15 feet all the time. And you ask them, Hey, what's going on? They're like, well, I see a seam. And then you go watch the video and it's like, yeah, you see the seam until the middle flies in there at the very last second and closes it up. And now you're out of position. And so it's kind of not just seeing the game, but understanding how the game works. And then also responsibilities, you know, we'd like our middle back. We don't really play like a middle middle where our middle backs in the court as much. I'd like them to um, be more responsible for the last third of the court sideline to sideline um, balls off hand tips and throws that are deep um, balls that are hit hard, um, but that are over the block or, you know, high seam. Um, so we, we like to have a little more depth there, but again, all of, all of that is somewhat player dependent too of how comfortable we are. Uh, with players, like as Jared said, we gave Zoe a little more of a green light just because she's maybe not going to be in the position I'd like her to be all the time, but she does some things athletically to make up for it. So um, we probably gave her a little more free reign than we would normally give. Emma Halter is probably going to be in that range too. We're trying to adjust some things with her mechanically, but she's uh, she's a Zoe esque kind of kid. Like she'll see some stuff that maybe I don't even see and make some plays where it's she's going to get a little more of a green light from us. I think the other component of that is if Eric talks about, if you see a seam, you know, sequential pattern I, I talked about earlier, but balls are set inside or outside, high or low or on or off. And young players don't see that a lot. So that seam is, can vary by five or 10 feet in terms of where their, their spots are. So you, you've got to have a lot of trust that they're seeing where that depth is and where those, where the attacker's feet are getting to those, those zones based on where that set is to be able to give them the shots. And I think over a period of time, you would bet that by just being in the same spot over a period of time is going to be more consistent than someone reading, right? If I have six or three Eric Sojis out there playing defense, yeah, they might have a lot more flexibility to be able to go see it and, and do that. But that's, that's a unique type of player. And if you are going to shift into a, if you are going to have a green light and you are going to move into a seam or you are going to make some adjustments out of base organically, I'm assuming we, we would all like that kid to get there as soon as can get stopped, get balanced so that they can come back if they need to. And the way, the way I talk to about our kids is there should be some little pause of like, Hey, I'm settled and stopped before contact. And I think yeah. when you can get comfortable doing that, you may not feel like you're working as hard as you th think you should be working, but the game's going to slow down a little bit for you. Yep. I mean, as human beings, we see better. We see better when we're stopped and still. And so, um, I don't know that that we try to espouse that. And same thing for our blockers. You know, we don't want our blockers walking back to base. We want them to get there, or get stopped, be in some balanced position where they can kind of see what's happening before they want to react and go. Yep. I love the key: the faster you see, the faster you move. Yeah. For the longer you see, the faster you move. So good stuff. Thanks. Hey, Eric. So um, as we're watching um, transition offense here, what changes we talked about kind of your offensive philosophy, what changes in transition, if anything, does the tempo change? Does the, does the location of the set change or do you try to keep that as similar as possible kind of throughout both phases? Yeah, for sure. Dig dependent, right? Dig and approach dependent right there. You see Logan picking up a tip. Um, you know, how do you transition out of those plays where she obviously doesn't have the runway that she would have if she didn't have to pick that up? You'll see her. She goes and hits a rip here yep. or at least gets into that approach where she's inside. Um, look, it all begins with trying to get depth. If we can get the hitter some depth, it doesn't have to be, like I said earlier, wide. 
if they can get some depth, they can create some momentum towards the net. Um, you know, if it's a good dig high up and down from, uh, you know, a non hitter digging, we'd like the tempo to remain the same, but again, the same principles that we don't want to take swings away. That was probably the hardest thing to, to modulate and adapt is getting that communication loop going from hitter to setter of, you know, what kind of tempo the hitter wants. I think maybe, I don't know, I'm not around the men's game as much. Um, but I think there's that challenge in the women's game. For some reason, they have a hard time with that communication loop. I don't know if they feel like they're hurting each other's feelings or, or what. Um, you know, if we, if we don't have everything lined up, we'd like that ball to be high and let our hitters go be physical. For sure, when things get out of system, one of the systems we've adapted and taken from the men's game is that we want to be high and inside and relatively tight to the net and go up and play that game. And so – um, like Jared referenced earlier, we're training all of our players, not just our setters, to set that ball. So we're getting pretty proficient at it, and we're training our hitters how to hit it, which was maybe even more of a challenge than the setting piece because, like I said, they all want to get 25 feet deep and take this big, long, crazy approach at it, and if the ball's tight, you can't do that. Uh, but I also I think we're getting pretty good at kind of playing that net game you know, it just gives you as an attacker a lot more options to go up and be aggressive at the block, to tip and throw from a high point if that's where you're going, to recycle balls off the block. Um, I don't know. It's for sure something that I brought back from the men's game. You teed this slide up perfectly. So 22%, 23% of your attacks in the NCAA tournament this year uh, came in out of system situations. And so... Uh, Jared, I like what you said about teaching all your players to set. How much time do you spend on doing that? And as you answer that question, I'm going to throw some uh, some out of system hitting attempts up there. Yeah, I like to look at stats. I think your stats are wrong on the Louisville. I don't think we've had 117 swings in three games out of system. But... <laughs> <laughs> so those might be a little bit off. Um, but... I'll have to double check that. <laughs> I think. Um... You know, it's, it's incorporated in all of our drills, right? Um, you know, we've, we've had some – we try to kind of understand where to make good swings. And, uh, you know, you want your kill percentage and your, your error percentage to be at certain points, so your hitting efficiency is there. And so for players at an early age, what, what does that look like and how do you manage those swings and putting them in those scenarios? But a lot of our drills are started with setter digging or just kind of chaos where we can get balls further and further back off the net. Um, you know, it's it, the more that we can get our non-setter setting behind the 10 foot line, the better you're going to be, because that's where the high errors come in. That's where the inefficiency comes in. And that's the biggest challenge. And that takes the longest time to be able to get that step close speed into the ball, get it aligned on your right shoulder, your shoulder. Can you attack it high in the last 10 feet of the court and create more of an out of system game? So there's, there's a lot of components that I could kind of go more into detail, but it's, it's, you want to become really efficient. And I think Maddie was one that really improved on, you know, early on, it was a big struggle for us, her in that area. And we spent more time probably this year than, than any other year, just on our defense and transition game early on, we were all offense, but then that got pretty good, pretty fast. Thanks to our communication, our players, but the defensive side of the transition became really important. A lot of that too is training the hitters how to how to manage situations, how to identify not just the set, but where they are relative to the set, whether they're getting a great approach, not a great approach, and where they're putting those balls. Again, another thing I think comes from the men's game. Everybody thinks the men just bomb balls, but you watch their secondary game. It's I think it's probably the most special thing they do, and it's just the creativity of where they're throwing balls or. I don't know. The great teams just don't give you very much. Right. Yeah. And you constantly feel like there's some pressure on you. They're not giving you a free ball back to your libero. It's, you know, they're putting your setter on the ground and, um, and they're just not making a lot of errors in those situations. Yeah. I think if you're a high school, I like to look at it. I like to look at it one thing. If you go back to the slide with it, with the out of system stuff, right. Um, you know, I always think of this game as separation of 4%, 25, 23, right? Like it's about 4% of the time you're, there's a difference of you winning a game and not. And so if you're getting these numbers at 26, 28, 26, whatever, 117, um, how many of those out of system balls are from <laughs> it's a, your set? It's 18, Jared. Thanks for calling me out. It's 18. <laughs> uh, that was a typo there. So it was, uh, 
the 117 total throughout the tournament. I, I uh, mistyped that there. It's all right. Um, but how many of those are non-setters? And so you're looking at how many missed swings do you come from a non-setter setting? That's a significant number. So you might have 18 balls out of 26 that are coming from a non-setter. Um, yep. And so that, that becomes a big component. And can you set that and can they, you build trust? Like that's a great set right there. Yeah. I mean, it's just, that, it's that's just that's inside. Cool. It's, I mean, sorry to interrupt you, Jared. Go back to that ball from Logan at 30 feet. That's the stuff like we're that in our gym is like people are going nuts. Yep. Like, these are the plays, right? Like, and it's Maddie does a nice job managing this. The dig's great, all that stuff. But the fact that she gets that thing up, like that's right where we're trying to set it and gives her an opportunity to go make that play. Like those are the backbreaking plays, I think, against us. And is and this we'll let, specific we'll what let we just Logan saw? Know is that something that you're training? Like, that's special. Yes. We will throw first ball contacts out of it just like that. And we're spending a lot of time so they know that zone, where their outside hitters start their footwork, um, what that what that tempo looks like. And we're, you know, if anybody's being the most aggressive on our team about calling it, it's Eric. Like, just throw that thing up by the net. And, and we're creating opportunities over and over on it. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll add one thing and then we got to wrap it up. Uh, well, two things. For, for the high school coaches, club coaches that are listening, or anyone really, go to practice and listen to what your attackers are calling in medium pass and out of system situations. And my guess is you're going to hear them calling the wrong thing a lot, especially at the youth level. So they get in the habit, go, 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 go. And so now all of a sudden they're calling for a second step set when you're on the 15 foot line. Nobody can do that over and over again, even the best. And so go to practice, listen for that call, and I bet you there's some meat on the bone in terms of upgrading the the, the set type and the quality of swing that you can give your attackers there. Um, and for the high school coaches, I would say, like, when they come to our camps, like the bigger – setters, there's non-setters cannot set a ball. It's flat. It's not high enough. It's wide. They, it's probably where – I would imagine that's where a significant portion of errors come from at the high school level is from a non-setter having to step in. Yep. Well, that's great advice to practice that and get all those reps. That's uh, that's something we can probably all be a little bit better at. Jarrett, Eric, I know you have a meeting to go to. Mike and I have a water bottle to give away. So if you want to, uh, if you want to hop off, um, thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. We know it's valuable, and uh, I know I learned a lot, and we have a lot of viewers out there that uh, that learned also, and they're saying thanks in the comments. So. Jarrett and Elliot, uh, Jarrett, Elliot, Eric Sullivan. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Guys. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Okay. If you would like this Stanley cup water tumbler, go ahead and we'll give you a few more, a uh, few more moments to throw hashtag GMS plus in the comments section. Uh, see the instructions right there. Hashtag GMS plus in the comment section will run. A drawing in just a minute. Um, Mike, give us a little update of what we got going on this summer with uh, with with our coaching clinics and summer camps. Yep. If you'd like to host or if you'd like us to run a summer camp for you, um, we do those June, July and August. Uh, July is pretty well booked up, but some of the other dates are still available. And then as you can see here, we've got a busy a busy schedule here. We're pretty much in every area of the country. Uh, you can get all the details on our website, goldmetalsquared.com, uh, on these events, dates, locations, who the clinicians are. Um, we have a ton of, we're going to have a ton of new material in the manual. So if you've been to a clinic before, uh, come back. We're upgrading some of the motor learning stuff or updating some of the motor learning stuff. Um, and uh, some of the new research out there is going to be integrated uh, into the manual. So uh, new or repeat, we hope to see you out there. Okay. We, I'm going to uh, let you know what's going on next week as I pull up our little drawing tool here. Uh, next week, we'll be with Dan Fisher uh, from Pittsburgh. They've made two consecutive Final Fours. And then the week after that, two weeks from today, we'll be with the Louisville staff also coming off a second consecutive Final Four. So um, we're excited to be joined by those coaches also. Please make sure that you can join us. Uh, same place, YouTube or Facebook. All right, I'm going to throw this up here and uh, do a drawing for our Stanley Cup bottle, which is awesome, by the way. 
Give me just a second here. Okay, we are going to do a drawing in three, two, one. And if your name pops up on here, go ahead and send us an email to info at goldmetalsquared.com. And Paul, Paul, send us an email, info at goldmetalsquared.com. McKenna will get that and, and we'll make sure we get this sent out to you. That's info at goldmetalsquared.com. Everyone out there, thank you so much for spending the last hour with us. We appreciate it. We hope you learned some new things, go ahead and visit goldmetalsquared.com for more information. Uh, so much of what we talked about, we have highlighted on GMS Plus. You can start a 30-day free trial also at goldmetalsquared.com, but we have a bunch of tempo-related videos. We talked a lot about that with the Texas coaches. We have a bunch of defensive-related videos, uh, setting videos, drills, lots of drills that can help us in these areas. So go ahead and check out GMS Plus. You can start a 30-day free trial and we got tons of good content and more content coming out every single week uh, to throw on to GMS plus Mike, any final thoughts? No, that was awesome. Thanks Dave for, uh, for setting that up. Um, I, th I thought that was really good conversation and uh, obviously a lot of fun to chat with the national championship staff. So pretty exciting stuff. All right, everyone, we will see you next week for what we love about Pittsburgh. We'll talk a lot about the 6-2 offense they ran, and, uh, and we'll have some good questions for Dan Fisher. So we will see you in seven days. Have a good one, everybody.